Hello, my name is Michelle Karkner, and I'm a PhD student within the Department of Plant Science at the University of Manitoba. And today, the title of my talk is The Impact of On-Farm Selection Environment and Phosphorus Capture in Organic Wheat. This is an outline of the presentation that I'll be giving today, a bit about the background of the project, an overview of the phosphorus puzzle within agroecosystems, how plants respond to low phosphorus environments and how we can measure efficiency, and the genetic material I'm using within the project. Then we're going to move into the experiment, materials and methods, preliminary results, and some preliminary discussions. So phosphorus in agroecosystems is a bit of a double-edged sword as it's an essential macronutrient for all living organisms. However, synthetic phosphorus fertilizer is sourced from non-renewable resources, it's geographically restricted, and there's no closed loop system in place when it's exported off farm as food or feed. Phosphorus, manure, and synthetic can run off from farms and become a pollutant to water bodies through eutrophication. So we can have a little bit too much and we can also have a, a little bit of too little. One way to decrease phosphorus requirements on farm may be through breeding. This is the soil phosphorus cycle. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I don't have the time today, but essentially plants can only take up phosphorus when it's in soil solution. There's a lot of phosphorus in um, prairie soils However, it's oftentimes in a form that plants can't take up, either in the organic phosphorus fraction or the organic pho uh, phosphorus fraction. So uh, crops grown under organic conditions where we don't use synthetic fertilizers um, or in low phosphorus conditions, much like a lot of organic farms in the prairies, they must place energy into biologically mediated nutrient supply. So crops respond to low phosphorus through soil exploration by changing the root morphology and the size of the roots, partnerships with arbresco mycorrhizae so that the hyphae can expand the surface area that is explored because phosphorus is quite immobile in the soil, or soil exploitation. So roots can exude organic anions, extracellular enzymes like phosphatases and protons in order to break the bonds within the mineral phosphorus complexes or to um, use phosphatases to uh, free up some of the phosphorus within the organic fraction. So how do we measure this? Well, um, we can measure this through phosphorus use, effic use efficiency. So we can look at the phosphorus uptake efficiency. So that's the ratio of phosphorus taken up per phosphorus available in the soil. We can look at phosphorus utilization efficiency. So that's grain phosphorus per total phosphorus taken. And we can look at the total phosphorus use efficiency. So uh, how efficient was the crop at using the phosphorus that it had? So that's a combination of phosphorus uptake efficiency and phosphorus utilization efficiency. The genetic material that I'm using within this experiment is from a participatory wheat breeding program. I won't go too much into detail from it, but it started in Manitoba in 2011 and it expanded to Canada wide in 2013. So farmers were sent F3 seeds from uh, crosses, uh, and they planted it in small plots on their farm, just like you can see in the picture here. They selected three th 300 spikes. We cleaned the seed, sent it back, and then they planted the small plots again. And they repeated, the three th th repeated this three times so that we end up with an F6 generation. The populations that uh, are used in this experiment are from the F6 generation. So to tie the phosphorus conundrum and participatory plant breeding, organic participatory plant breeding together, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of selection environments. It's well understood that the selection environment in which early generation um, crops are tested and selected impacts the final production performance. For example, we have regional breeding programs in Canada. There's also some research showing that early generation spring wheat selection under organic versus conventional and then tested under organic and conventional that the organic lines produced better under organic versus the lines that were uh, selected under conventional. And there's also some research looking at early generation germ wheat selection under zero till and then tested in zero till and conventional and early vigor for zero till selected lines were consistently higher in all environments. So this brings me to one of the hypotheses within my PhD. By selecting under organic production environments, farmers will select for lines that utilize phosphorus more efficiently and access greater organic pools of phosphorus than their parents. So moving into the actual experiment, 
It was, it's been conducted over three years and taking place in Lebo, Manitoba. So 2020 was the first year, 2021 is the second year, and 2022 will be my third year. The soil phosphorus was very low, but adequate in all other nutrients. It was a factorial randomized complete block design. The first treatment being soil phosphorus statins with manure added and manure not added. And the second treatment was the wheat genotypes. So I tested four different families from the PPB project, but we're gonna talk about only one family. So the, that is the red 556O2HR family that is in a red square here. The red fife and 5602HR are the parents, they were crossed. Red fife is a land race and 5602HR uh, is a modern variety. The F3s were sent to these two farmers, they selected on their own farm. This is the F3 and the red fife plus 5602HR is a physical mixture of the parents. And the F3 and the mixture were added for another hypothesis that we won't talk about today. So the data collection and analysis, the measurements were all the normal agronomic and measurements that we would normally take when testing out different genotypes. But I really wanted to focus in on yield and the phosphorus calculations. So I'm going to use yield as a seasonal snapshot through the genotypes performance. So if you were on the prairies or in Manitoba, you know that 2020 was um, very dry. And in 2021, it was extremely dry. That is reflected in the yields in 2020 and 2021. We had a, a very significant site interact site effect. We had no genotypic effects, which means that the farmer lines performed just as well as the um, parents. We did have a manure site interaction, which means that in 2020, the genotypes responded more to the environment to the manure than the genotypes in 2021 did. And that will be reflected in the phosphorus calculations uh, that we'll be talking about today. And I suspect that that's partly because of poor mineralization of the manure that was added and also just poor performance on the uh, genotypes part. So first we're gonna talk about pea uptake efficiency. As a reminder, this is the total plant phosphorus that was taken up per the total available phosphorus that was available. So that's soil, indigenous soil phosphorus and the fertilizer phosphorus, the manure phosphorus. In the dry conditions, I'm calling 2020 dry and 2021 drought. In the dry conditions, phosphorus uptake efficiency was much higher um, in the parents than the progeny. And that red fife land race was quite variable, but in the negative P treatment within the dry conditions, you see that the farmer line, they were a little bit more efficient than uh, in terms of uptake than the uh, modern variety and more in line with red fife. I should say we didn't have significant differences between any of the genotypes and any of the calculations. We can move into the drought conditions and uh, with phosphorus added, we didn't really see any difference between the lines. Um, and then in negative P, you can see we didn't see too much difference between the lines and uptake. For phosphorus utilization efficiency, so that is how much phosphorus was the plant able to move from the biomass into the seed. In the positive P, in dry conditions treatment, you can see that the modern variety at 5602HR uh, was much more efficient in translocating phosphorus from the biomass into the seed. And then the uh, progeny and the one parent uh, were not, didn't do nearly as well as 5602HR. In the negative P dry conditions, you can see that the uh, progenies were a bit different. PWA00KB translocated a, a decent amount of phosphorus into the grain, into the grain compared to others. Um, and that PWA00JG and 5602HR were um, a little bit more on par. In the drought conditions, um, 5602HR still did pretty well. The red fife um, parent uh, did not do very well. It was more in line with PWAJG. However, uh, KB um, seemed to do just as well with 56. And then I did, you can't really see too many discernible differences between the genotypes and the negative P in 2021. So this is the phosphorus use efficiency. This is the uptake and the utilization um, combined together. In the positive P dry conditions, 5602HR was very efficient with the phosphorus that I was able to take up 
much more so than one of the parents and the uh, progeny. And so the, this kind of shows that this modern variety uh, responded more to added manure than the others. However, in the low P environments, 5602HR was not as efficient as the parents, um, as the progeny, and it was more in line with red fife. And then in the drought conditions, there wasn't too much difference between the genotypes with manure added. And uh, red fife was not as efficient as the others. However, it was a little bit more in line with PWAGG. Was PU sufficiency driving yield? Well, it depends. In 2020, within just dry conditions, it, within the non-manure treatment, there was a positive significant correlation between yield and uh, phosphorus use efficiency. However, when manure was added, there was no significant uh, correlation relationship between yield and phosphorus use efficiency. In 2021, under drought conditions, there was a, a positive significant relationship between phosphorus use efficiency and yield, um, and there was a positive correlation relationship between phosphorus use efficiency and yield in the manure. My guess is that because the phosphorus wasn't able to be taken up as well as it was in 2020, that um, these lines were acting very similar to um, as if there was no manure added. A combination of poor mineralization and also um, poor performance. It was difficult to capture differences between cultivars due to poor mineralization and dry uh, drought conditions in 2021. A lot of times in uh, genotypic studies, if the performance is poor, it's really difficult to find significant differences between the genotypes if they're not performing optimally. We did not see cultivar differences between treatments in uh, efficiency. One might think that the breeding efforts over time may have uh, bred in some phosphorus use efficiency, but we didn't see that here within the non-phosphorus treatments and McDonald et al compared year of release to efficiency and response, and um, they also found no relation. Efficiency and uptake is related to environmental conditions, more so genetic differences and the selection environment. Um, however, I have one more year of study to do, and uh, genetic differences have been observed by others in many different kinds of crops. One question I may uh, leave you with to think about, as I've been thinking about it a lot, the majority of phosphorus use efficiency calculations in experiments derive from the research done on nitrogen use efficiency, but I wonder if this is appropriate, if we should be looking at different kinds of calculations. Nitrogen within the seed is beneficial because it increases the protein. However, greater grain phosphorus is not beneficial for marketability or nutrition, and the phosphorus utilization efficiency or the phosphorus harvest index has not been connected to yield, not in this research and not in other research that's been done in the past. So this may be an opportunity to examine cultivars with lower phosphorus utilization efficiency and higher yield potential since they might be independent of one another. With that, I'd like to thank you for attending my Green Bigger talk. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Martin Entz, and the technical support and my committee members. I would also like to thank my funding partners uh, that helped make this research happen. Thank you.